he was changed. And then we're going to talk about somebody else uh, in the Bible that was a chosen vessel. So I'm going to start in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. It says, then, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed um, near Damascus, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, uh, and, and heard a verse, and that's what I cut out my last message. <laughs> Do you guys remember that? Who remembers that? Because that tells you you're paying attention. Um, let me just pull that out. Go right to my Bible, Acts 9. you think I would have changed that. Acts 9. All right. Okay. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, in a verse, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. <clears throat> and he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. So this is pretty radical what happens. I mean, uh, Paul is out there. He's getting ready to persecute, kill, murder, pillage uh, Christians. Um, he was filled with anger. The Bible says that he was breathing threats against the disciples. Um, he was so angry that he would do anything, including murder, to stop the gospel from moving forward. In his, you know, in his perspective, this gospel was tearing up everything that he knew or believed from his, from his Jewish religion. Um, we can see with Stephen, uh, Stephen was um, quite a, a man of God. He, the Bible says that he was filled with, with the Spirit. And in Acts chapter 7, 58, um, Stephen gets up and he shares this really awesome message. But in this message, there's a lot of conviction going out there about the Jews and how they crucified Jesus. Well, they didn't like that, and so they stoned him. And what's interesting about Stephen is he said something that Jesus said, on the cross. He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen? What's interesting is in chapter 7, verse 58, it says, and they cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul. So who was responsible for Stephen's death? Saul was. All right? Now let me throw you something else that I want you to be thinking about. Okay? Um, so Jesus said, forgive them for they know what they, what they do. So he's telling, uh, you know, his father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So Stephen says the same thing. Well, what if he didn't say that? Would Paul have been forgiven? Well, I don't know. Um, and not only that, Paul wrote three quarters of the New Testament. So in Stephen's dying, he says, forgive Paul, the person who's killing me. Interesting. Something to be th thinking of, you know. So, um... So Saul, in Acts verse 8, 1 through 3, you see him, he's continuing to persecute the church. Um, you see him consenting to different deaths and persecutions. But there's a change of heart. Somebody say a change of heart. Now I want you to remember this. That Paul that was out, who killed Stephen, who was out crucifying Christians, that was the old Saul. That was the old Paul. That was the old man. Amen? All right. But now let's take a look at, at the new man, all right? Um, so what happens is Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? So he doesn't recognize the voice of who it is. He just knows that whoever this is, it's the Lord. And God's rep uh, reply, Jesus' reply was, it's Jesus, he said, the, um, in whom you are persecuting. Amen? And what's interesting about that, too, is that Jesus literally isn't on a cross at that point. He's risen from the dead. He's not suffering any personal uh, affliction there, but he says, why are you persecuting me? Because 
When Christians were being persecuted, in persecuting them, they persecuted him. See, the Bible says in Ephesians, and this isn't in my notes, you get it for free. In Colossians, that the head of the body is who? Jesus. Somebody say, the head of the body is Jesus. Okay, then he says the body of Christ, which is us, churches are the body of Jesus. Now, has anybody ever um, experienced some pain in your body and your head didn't figure it out? I mean, no, if your, your body hurts, your, your head's going to feel the pain. You know what I'm saying? And if something happens to your head, well, then it affects your body. You know what I'm saying? The two are, are one. See, it's the same way here because Jesus, the body was being persecuted and the head was feeling it. We're connected. Somebody say, yeah. So when you're suffering and struggling and going through hard times in your life, you can know that Christ feels what you're feeling. Have you ever talked to somebody and they know exactly what you're going through because they've been there before? Or they know exactly what they're, you're going through because they're in it right now? And isn't that powerful? That someone can look in your eyes and say, you know what? I know how you're feeling because they felt it. Isn't that powerful? Every time you're going through something, you can know that Jesus is going through it with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, um, so God speaks to this dude named Ananias, all right? And, uh, and, and, and he basically tells Ananias, listen, this, this Saul dude, all right, he, he uh, has been a change of heart, and you need to pray for him and so that he can be healed, right, and have the Spirit of God. And so Ananias' re uh, reply was something like, do you know what this dude has done? Like, he's like a murderer. He's like a killer, you know? And God's reply was, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He says, it doesn't matter what he did, he's a chosen vessel. Amen? God chose Paul, a murderer, a threat to the church, to be the opposite. That's the new man. Because before, Paul was bringing death to the body, and now what's he doing? He's bringing life to the body. A complete change of heart. And not only that, I believe that, well, what does the Bible say? In Matthew 5, 44 through 45, how does it, what does it say to do for people who are persecuting you? Does it say to persecute them back? Does it say to give them a call and let them have it? Does it say get on social media and say something? Does it say, you know, show up at their house, knock on the door and let them have it? No, it says to do something else. It says pray for those who persecute you. Somebody say, I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. See, I believe the disciples, see, the disciples were trained by Jesus, okay? And so they heard the words of Jesus. And I believe that these disciples were not only trained, but they were training the church at that point. And what were they training them to do? The things that Jesus told them to do. So I believe at that point, the disciples and the people of God who were being persecuted by Judaism and being persecuted for Paul, by Paul were praying for, the, for, for them, was praying for Paul. What happened? Paul got saved. What would happen if we prayed for those who persecute us? What would happen? There could be a change of heart. Stephen said, forgive them for I know not what they do. That benefited Paul because he was the one that was doing it. The disciples are praying for the people that are persecuting him. And that benefited him because he was persecuting. We need to pray for people who persecute us. Amen? What, so what's a vessel? He says he's a chosen vessel. Well, a vessel carries things, okay? I remember I shared this example uh, last time we were together. We, when we went to Scotland many, many years ago, we would load our cars up into these barges or these ships or these vessels, okay? And they would carry our cars over to the next little aisle so we could drive them off and continue to have transportation. See, that ship was a vessel, amen? Um, Sometimes one of the most chaotic times, for, chaotic times for Stu is on Wednesday when the food truck comes, and sometimes it comes right in the middle of giving out food. And how many of you guys know that could be interesting? 
That truck is a vessel, and it's carrying food. Amen? Uh, me and Amy, we, were, uh, we went up to go look at the, what was the name of the house? The Lorenzo together for Christmas with the kids. And on the way home, I saw bus after bus driving by. Those buses were carrying children, probably from a sporting event or something. Vessels carry something. See, Paul was a chosen vessel to carry the gospel. Amen? But in carrying the gospel, um, there, was a, there was a shift. We talked about how he went from murdering, but now let's look at, not only did he go from murdering to carrying the gospel, but he went from being the person who was persecuting to being persecuted. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two 22 through 23, he says this, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things that come to me regularly for my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak, who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. Okay? So Paul, he's saying, listen, I'm being persecuted all the time. You know, I, I shared about how people stone people, because we think, you know, you lay them up against the wall and you start throwing stones. Well, that wasn't what they did at all. They dug a hole up to your head, and they threw stones at your head. One time in particular, Paul actually dies, and the brethren pray for him to be made alive. The Bible, uh, um, Bible doesn't say this, but a lot of scholars agree that Paul looked beaten because of the way that he was persecuted. What a change. My question to you is this. What are you carrying? I was um, praying about this in the car and I saw a little picture of my favorite movie um, Emperor's New Groove I've watched that movie a lot and one of my favorite parts is when Kronk has taken the poison and he's going to kill the emperor with it but he accidentally gets the dishes mixed up and Yzma is about to drink the poison and he says this don't drink the poison don't drink the poison you know like a cough don't drink the poison bitterness anger Resentment, poison. Don't drink the poison. You don't want to, see, there are people who carry that with them everywhere they go. And you're, and just being in their presence, hearing what they're saying and what they're doing, it's like poison. Don't drink the poison. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 20 through 22, it says, my son, give attention to my word. Incline your ear to my saying. Do not let them depart from your heart. They are life to those who hear them and health to all their bones. That word health can also be translated medicine. The word and the words of God are like medicine. The love that's in it, the joy that's in it, the good things that are in it will cause us to grow and flourish and spread it everywhere we go. Amen. Amen. It says here in Colossians 3, 1 through 11, Then if you, being raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, fornication, uncleanness, passion, 
even desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. I really want you to hear this part. But now you yourselves are to put off all these. He says put them off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to each other since you have, since you have put off the, ready, old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Amen? See, Paul's old man was a murderer. Paul's old man was a threat to the, to the gospel. But the new man, it's a new creation. Amen? Um, that word set your mind there, it says set your mind on things above, means to continuously choose to think things that are above. To continue to choose the right thing. Amen? Some days, I, uh, this is funny, about two weeks ago, I did not feel like swimming. Some days the pool at the Y is really cold. <laughs> and I got in the pool and I said out loud, man, I do not want to swim today. I don't want to do this today. And the lifeguard who sees me almost every day um, yelled out across from me, just get in there and do it anyway. And I did. <laughs> Amen? In order to reap the benefits of doing that, I have to do that regularly. I can't just go once and then not do it for two weeks. In order to reap the benefits of it, I have to continue to do it. See, some things happen at the altar, and that's great. I've heard of people that were healed at the altar right away, and that's awesome. I've heard of people that have come to the altar and left their addictions there, and it's, it's never come back for them. But I know of others that have things in their flesh, things in their old man, that they've had to continuously make choices away from. They've had to make the choice to give that to Christ, even though they don't want to. How many guys know being a Christian is about making choices? We make choices every day. Amen? As soon as we get up in the morning, we make a choice. We make choices to pray. We make choices to read the Word. We make choices to fellowship with one another. We make choices to go to church. We make choices every single day to maybe not say what we're thinking. Amen? I have a filter, but when I was younger, I didn't have a filter. And I see that in some of my children. They don't have filters, you know? And they just say stuff, you know? And I remember one time, my brother... Um, uh, woke me up with a plastic bat across the side of my head just for fun. And my mom asked him, well, what'd you do that for? And I thought to myself, boy, I wonder. <laughs> you know? It's things like that would just kind of run through my mind. Instead of, I, I had to learn as I got older to filter my thoughts. It's not good to just say what you're thinking, is it? You have to filter those thoughts. My parents would say, who do you think I am? And I thought, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I learned to not say that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a choice, isn't it, church? And are choices easy? No, they're hard. And what Paul is saying, he's saying this. Since you died with Christ and you've risen again, don't live like the old man. Live like the new man. The old man is dead. He's gone. That was the old way that we did things. That was the old way that Jeff was, was and, and it did things. But let the new man arise. Amen? And, and sometimes we've got to take the stuff off that stinks. You know, yesterday I got to rake the lawn, and the backyard is scary because we have dogs that poop, and I have not been diligent, <laughs> that's my wife, in cleaning up the poop. So I got to go out there and, and rake the leaves, and I'm not kidding, there's so much poop out there. And I looked down at my shoes, and I must have had a quarter of an inch of crap, they'll never forget this example, a quarter of an inch of stuff on the bottom of my shoes, and I came in the house, and I was tempted to just quickly walk through. But praise God, I didn't. I took the crap off, and I laid them outside the door. Church, sometimes you got to just, you get out there in the world, and you get all dirty. You get, it gets all over you. You got to take the crap off and leave it at the door. Amen? And be the new man that God has called you to be, not the old man. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Hidden with Christ is a Greek word meaning something that was already accomplished. Hallelujah. Your salvation was already accomplished. Hallelujah. Forgiveness of sin already accomplished. All you have to do is ask him and he'll forgive you. Amen. 
And he says in Colossians, Colossians 3, 12 through 17, he says, put on the new man. He says, therefore, as the elect of God. Now, what does that mean? You know, I'm not going to go into it, but some of you probably know that we have elected President Trump to be our president. We elected him. We chose him. Some of us didn't, but the majority of us did. All right? We chose him. All right? God chose you, right? And all we have to do is respond. If you don't respond, I'm sorry. You'll, you won't be saved. If you don't make Jesus Lord and Savior over your life, you won't be saved. You have to make that choice to make Jesus Lord and Savior over your life. I remember I was loading trucks one night at UPS when I was a lot younger and buffer. And we were, I was never buff. Uh, loading these trucks, you know, 11, 4 o'clock in the morning, loading trucks at UPS. Christmas was a lot like Elder John was going through. Very, very, very busy. And word had gotten out that I was a youth pastor on the line. The line had about nine or ten trucks. And we had supervisors yelling up and down the line, Get moving! It's, it's coming! They're all coming now! Get ready! It was like absolutely crazy. But this guy comes in my load and he says, Hey, I, uh, I heard that you're a pastor. I said, uh, Yeah, I am. He says, uh, Can I be forgiven of my, like, forgiven of my sins? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Have you asked Jesus as Lord and Savior over your life? Uh, no. I said, well, if you'd like to, then you can be forgiven of your sins. And he walked away. It's a choice. We have choices to make. Amen? So in Colossians 3, 12 through 17, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, these are the things we get to put on, tender mercies, kindness, Humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, and this is not an option, it says you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To once you were rich, called in one body, and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He says, put on tender mercies, put on kindness, put on meekness, put on long-suffering, put on forgiveness, and above all, put on love. He says, put those on. A lot of times I ask Amy, does this match? Because I'm horrible about matching stuff. If it was up to me, I'd come in here with a purple shirt and an orange tie. I mean, I'm just horrible at matching stuff. And I'll say, hey, does this work? <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> this morning she said, yeah, that works. You know, because I was even concerned about this. He said, that works. She said, that works. See, it was, but if, if it was an orange tie and a purple shirt, it probably wouldn't work. All right? So I'd, I would have to make a choice to take off the stuff that doesn't work and put on the stuff that does. Amen? See, in, since we have Christ in us, we can make those kinds of decisions. Before we knew Christ, we didn't even know that was even whatever. It was easy to be angry. It was easy to be resentful. We didn't care. We were bitter. Walking in unforgiveness. We didn't make choices because we didn't know we had a choice. And then when we asked Jesus into our hearts, he gave us the opportunity to make some good choices. Amen? Somebody say yeah. Amen. All right. That's the new man. It says, put off the old man. Anger, filthy language. See, Paul had a pretty good revelation of the contrast between the old man and the new man. Murdering people is a bad thing. <laughs> right? But he knew that. He had revelation of that. And, and he was a chosen vessel of Christ. So for the next five minutes, I want to talk to you about another chosen vessel. Her name was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, during this Christmas season, I think of Mary and what it must have been like. I love to read the Gospels almost every day. Probably every day I read the Gospels. Not the whole thing, but I'll read a chapter or two or sometimes a lot. Because there's, that's Jesus there. And that's his attitude toward the people there. 
And that's his attitude toward me. And that's the attitude that he wants me to have. It's just so, it's as close as I can get to him in the word. Amen? And, and so Mary gave birth to Jesus. That just blows me away. And I was doing some research this morning. Did you know that Mary was incredibly young when she gave birth? Um, the, the, in Jewish law, um, children were considered that they, they could get married and they could start being adults. Are you ready for this? Boys at age 13. Girls at age 12. A lot of scholars agree Mary wasn't either of those. Most scholars would agree that Mary was probably 14 or 15. And I think, oh my gosh. I know it's a different culture. But still, 14 God picked a 14 or a 15-year-old little girl to give birth to his son. And, and then you look at Mary, and she's just so ordinary in the natural. I mean, she's read the prophecies. She's been educated, and she knows the law. She's looking forward to the Messiah. And um, a lot of scholars also say that, lot, that, that women, when they were that age, they dreamed of being the one that would give birth to the Messiah because they knew the Messiah was coming. But she just looked so ordinary, so normal, so typical. And not only that, she came from a place called Nazareth. There was nothing really bad about Nazareth, but there was also nothing really good about Nazareth either. It was, it was what we would call Hickville, USA. It was out in the middle of nowhere. There were hundreds of villages that looked just like it, but there was a saying, and you can see it in John 146. And then I'll pull back. Um, following the, uh, the day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was... Um, and then uh, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip was from the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found whom the Mo Moses and the law and also all the pro prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathanael said this, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That was a saying of the time. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? An ordinary Typical village. But you know, on the outside, that's what it looked like. But on the inside, there was something that was going to be very special about Nazareth. On the outside, Mary looked typical, but on the inside, there was something happening that was amazing. The Son of God being born. We look at ourselves, and I know that God calls us all special because we are, right? Right? But for the most part, we're all just ordinary, typical people that come from, I don't know if you want to call it, for me, Oneida is not ordinary or typical. I love Oneida. But for the most part, Oneida is just this typical, ordinary place, right? And this church from the outside looks like a typical, ordinary church. But on the inside, I believe that God wants to birth things that are amazing, Birth things that will give him glory. That he wants us to be chosen vessels individually and us as a church to be a chosen vessel. A chosen vessel to give out clothing Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. A chosen vessel to give out uh, food on Wednesdays. A chosen vessel to give out turkeys. Chosen vessel to give out presents. Turkey vessels or turkey vessels. Yeah, that'd be great. A turkey vessel. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Typical. Typical. Chosen vessels to work with kids, with what CARE is doing and what, what the clubs are doing, right? Just called to go and do those things. You are called to go out into your culture, to go out into your world, to go out into your workplace, to go out into your schools as chosen vessels and bear the gospel and give them the gospel. Amen. You're, we're ordinary, but on the inside, we've got something that is not ordinary. We have Jesus. 
the author, finisher of our faith, died on the cross, rose again. We have Jesus on the inside of us. Amen? But if you look at Mary, there's some things that come out, three things I want to talk about really quickly that come out when Mary is speaking or being spoken to by this angel. It's in Luke 1, 38. Um, well, actually, let me go up a little bit farther. Let me read all of 1, 26 to 38. Luke 1, 26 to 38. Now, in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. Virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. The word favored in the Greek also means the recipient of grace. But when she saw him, she was troubled in his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Um, and we can stop right there. So her response is, Well, how can this happen? I don't know a man. Mary was pure. She hadn't been with anybody. She was pure and she was pure-hearted. That a, that's a, a very powerful attribute that was in Mary, the chosen vessel. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Mary saw God. She held God in her arms. Number two. Mary was humble. In verse 38, it says, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. That word maidservant in the Greek means the lowest of the lowliest servants. She says, What am I? I'm not just, just a servant or a slave. I'm the lowest of servants and slaves. So the second thing is she was humble. And the third thing was, and it says there, she says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She believed. She said, you know what? According to your word, not mine, not others. I mean, she's probably thinking about Joseph. What's he going to think? I mean, it was, it was not good to have a baby or to be pregnant with another man's child then. Wouldn't that be on her heart? Like, wouldn't she be thinking that? Like, how is this going to work out? Now I, I haven't done anything. and Now here I am carrying something else that's not Joseph. How is he going to react? She didn't think those things. She said, all that put aside. Let it be in accordance to your word. Those are some attributes that I think that were important for Mary as a chosen vessel. It's things that we could be thinking about during this Christmas season. Are we pure-hearted? We all make mistakes. But do we ask God for forgiveness? And do we do things for ourselves or do things for others to make ourselves feel and be a certain way? Pure-hearted. Two, humble. Humble. And three, believe. God has chosen you. To be vessels. And it has nothing to do with what you've said, what you've done, good, bad, or somewhere in between. It has everything to do with what Jesus did on that cross when he died and rose again. Be the vessel God has called you to be. Don't carry the poison <laughs> and spread it around. Carry the gospel and spread it around. Amen? All right, let's all stand to our feet. And I want to pray for you today. And Pastor Bell, if you can... Do some worship while Pastor Dennis heads down. Amen. Lord, I just thank you, Father, for revelation, Father. Um